The following is a message from Crossroads Church, a grace-centered community in central Alberta, Canada. You know, I was driving in this morning and um, thought I'd turn on the radio and listen to some music. And I thought, you know, it's Sunday, so it probably should be the Christian station. So I put it on the Christian station this morning. And uh, usually that's kind of boring, but it was good today. Um, that's just being honest. I mean, you know. And um, you won't believe what I heard. I heard a guy, 103 years old, singing. And it was out of the park, home run. It was George Beverly Shea. You know him? He, um, he used to serve with Billy Graham and sing at all the crusades around the world. Right now, he's 103 years old. And just recorded a duet with Guy Penrod from the Gaither Vocal Band. And they played it this morning. And it is absolutely spectacular. I thought, if I'm 90 and can remember my name, that would be good. This guy's 103 and hitting home runs singing. Un- unbelievable. And I thought of that verse that said, even, even in their old age, they'll still bear fruit. Isn't that amazing? But I tell you that for this reason, that you may or may not know this, but this week in Red Deer has been set aside as Seniors Week. There's a whole lot of seniors in Red Deer, and a whole lot like me and Stu that will soon be there. And uh, the idea is that we would honor them and celebrate them this week. It kind of runs from Monday to next weekend, and we'll talk more about it uh, next Sunday. But I thought it would be really a good thing if in our travels through Red Deer this week in central Alberta, when we saw a senior, if we would just pray, Father, would you bless the latter years of their life more than the first? And would you still, even at their old age, draw them to Jesus? Wouldn't that be a good thing? Can you imagine how many people would get prayed for in our city this week if we just did that simple thing? So I I would like to encourage you to do that. Now we're going to launch today into a summer series on prayer. And the idea being that we're not just going to talk about prayer and try and learn about it, though that's very important. Um, In fact, it was the disciples that said, Lord, teach us how to pray. So we need to be taught how to pray. But we want to go a step further and actually do it. So we're going to do things like this P90 challenge and a few other things in our services in the days to come. And hopefully push prayer down into the DNA of our church and our very lives. My, my very real concern is that something like what happened last weekend would just be a one-off Sunday. And we would kind of check it off and say, now we've prayed and done our deal for the church on the other side of the world. And that was our prayer focus. Now we'll get on to other things. Not at all. I hope that prayer becomes a way of life so that we could say about our church, like, like we just heard Jesse um, and Janelle singing, that we would become literally a house of prayer. And then maybe a house of prayer for the nations. That would be a wonderful thing. Now the Bible has a lot to say about prayer. You might know that. So I thought, you know, wouldn't it be a good thing this first Sunday when we're kind of talking about prayer if we learned a memory verse together about prayer? Just kind of grabbed one of those great verses in the Bible about prayer and learned it together. I think we can do it. Your enthusiasm overwhelms me. Um, I think we can learn a verse together. Right now. All right. Let's put it up on the screen. One of the great... This is it. 1 Thessalonians 5.17. The whole verse we're going to learn. Pray continually. Let's try it together. Pray continually. Okay, one more time. Pray continually. Now, let's take it off the screen and see if we can do it. Let's try it again. 1 Thessalonians 5.17. Pray continually. You're really good. I'm excellent. We'll... Um, we ought to do that another Sunday. Now you've, now you've learned a verse in the Bible already today. This service has been life-changing, and you didn't even think it would be, so that's good. Well, apparently Paul, who, who wrote that verse, thought that prayer would become a way of life. Otherwise, why would you say pray continually? And my, my hope and my goal and my purpose is, really, is not to make you feel guilty if you don't pray continually, or it's not a way of life. You don't pray as much as you should or you think you should. I hope I can encourage you, and I hope that we can all get better at this thing called prayer. And so we've entitled this this little series for the summer called Prayer 101, suggesting that we're going to start at the bottom and move forward and all learn together. So that's where we're going. Um, I'll have a few other people teach on Sunday mornings throughout the summer. 
uh, as well as myself, and it should be a, a really good time. And I hope that by the time we're done, we actually find ourselves um, praying a whole lot more than maybe we even do right now. So how I'm going to deal with this today is just kind of lay the foundation. So I want to take you to my favorite verse in the Bible on prayer. I'll make a few comments about that. Then I want to raise two questions about prayer and give you a place to start. And then we'll all go home and do it. Does that sound good? And if I can remember what I just said, that's the order I'll follow. So let me show you the verse that's my favorite verse in the Bible on prayer. It's Revelation chapter 3 and verse 20. It's Jesus speaking, speaking to a group of Christians, and he says, Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him or her, and he or her with me. I know that you might not, at first glance, think of that as a verse on prayer. In fact, it's been used a whole lot of other ways evangelistically to suggest that Jesus sometimes knocks at the door of somebody's heart, and if they open up, he comes in, they become Christian. I'm sure you could use it that way though I don't think that's the primary purpose of it. I like to see it as a verse on prayer because I think that it sheds a whole pile of light on this matter of prayer, especially when we're getting started. So let me, let me tell you some things I've learned from that verse about prayer, just to sort of start us off. One would be this, that prayer is always something that's initiated by God, not me. Prayer is always initiated by Jesus. It's Jesus who moves us to pray. He says, I stand and knock. If you hear me and open the door, I'll come in. The idea is that every time that you think, you know, I should confess that sin. Or every time you feel a nudge from the Holy Spirit to pray for somebody. Or every time you think, you know, it'd be good if I started praying again. You have to understand that's Jesus already at work in your life, initiating this thing called prayer. Um, There's another place in the Bible where it says nobody seeks God. Now, what that means is nobody seeks God. It means if the Holy Spirit were taken away somehow, you would never have another thought about God, prayer, reading the Bible, or anything else. Every time you feel prompted or moved or reminded or suggested to that you should pray, it's already God in the background saying, let's get this thing going. So he initiates it. Prayer begins with God, not us. The invitation comes from him, and my prayer is the response. Now, that's a good thing to know. Already it begins to move it out of the area of kind of drudgery and, oh, I got to do this deal, to... Whoa, wait a minute. Jesus actually wants to connect with me. Now, if you saw it that way, it would change your perspective on prayer. That every time you think about it, it's like Jesus saying, Hey, I'd like to connect with you. Now, another thing that little verse tells me about prayer is that prayer is essentially an invitation to relationship. That's what it is. It's an invitation to relationship. When he says, I'll come in and eat with you and you with me, you're meant to think of table fellowship, a meal. Think of how much good connecting, community, relationship happens over a meal or a coffee or a beer or whatever else you do over a meal or a table. Now you eat, you drink, but it's, it's, it's the idea that relationship happens in that context. And it's Jesus saying, I would like to have relationship with you. That's what prayer is all about. Don't know if you know this or not, but you and I were created for relationship. Somebody once came to Jesus and said, you know, I can't figure this whole Old Testament out. It's like a lot of us. So they said to Jesus, can you just, can you kind of, this is my words, but can you dumb it down for me and just give it to me bullet? And Jesus said, I can do that. He said, I can summarize the whole thing in two statements. Here they are. He said, love the Lord God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. He said, for that sums up all the law and the prophets. Isn't that amazing? He summed up the whole Old Testament in those two statements. Love God, love your neighbor. What was he doing? He was defining life relationally. Now, here's a really, really big point when it comes to prayer. Don't miss it. The two dimensions of relationship, this way and this way, with God and with each other, are dynamically connected. 
If you have a really hard time going deep in relationships at this level, you'll have a really hard time connecting with God. It, they, they, they go together. You can't just connect intimately with God and not at this level. So I've often uh, thought, you know, if you want to start to pray, don't set aside 15 minutes and go in your room and shut the door and pray. Start working on your relationships here. Fix what needs to be fixed here. Start figuring out how to do a relationship this way because you'll never do good with God if you're not doing good at this level. The, the two, loving God and loving people, are connected. You were made for relationship. When you're doing well here, you'll do well here. When you're doing well here, you'll do well here. And the opposite's true as well. Um, I've come to see prayer more as a friendship than as a rigorous discipline. And it almost goes without saying that prayer is guided by right living as well as right thinking. Because if you're going to keep company with God, you ought to live in line with what he suggests you ought to live. So if we find it hard to form lasting relationships with those around us, we'll find it hard to uh, have a relationship with the God in heaven. And I I was thinking about that when I read this week about, um, I don't know if you know that famous picture, it was actually an etching, a wood carving really, of two praying hands. It was done originally in the 1400s by a man named Albrecht Dürer. And he and another man, a friend of his, Franz, were aspiring young artists. And they had their hearts set on going to art school, but they didn't have the money to go, so they started working. And they realized that with the meager incomes they had, that they would have to pool their incomes, then flip a coin or whatever they did. One of them would go to art school, hopefully do well, make money, then the other one would be able to go. So they did that, and as the coin flipped, it's Elbrecht that got to go to art school first, and he actually went and did very, very well, and actually became quite famous uh, for some of his artwork. And eventually, Albrecht remembered the deal, and he went back to relieve his friend Franz. He was going to go to work while, to support Franz while he went to art school. But to his horror, Albrecht discovered that the heavy manual labor that Franz had been doing had forever ruined his hands. He'd never now be able to be an artist. He forfeited his own artistic future for Albrecht. Well, one day, Albrecht found Franz on his knees. His hands joined together in prayer, gnarled, and yet offered up to God in in loving sacrifice. And hurriedly, Albrecht sketched those hands and then uh, produced them in the way that he did. That You can still see them today. And forever since, intercessory prayer has been symbolized by that etching that reminds us that prayer and friendship go together. In fact, the one that we pray to is a friend that had his hands pierced for us. Um, prayer and friendship always go together. Well, I, I go back to that verse, and I, it, it also reminds me that prayer is it's, it's speaking, and it's also listening. It's both. When you sit at a table with somebody, you speak and you listen, and the conversation goes back and forth. And prayer in a very real sense is actual conversation with the God that speaks. So I speak, he speaks, or he speaks, I speak. And, and so as we go through this series this summer, I hope you understand that when we say prayer, we're not just talking about the words that we come up with and pour out. We're also talking about a God that speaks into our hearts and into our lives. And so part of our time this summer, we'll think about that. In fact, I think Sean in July is going to talk about hearing, listening to the God that speaks, which is very much a part of real prayer. So having said that, let me just raise the first question that I wanted to raise. I just two simple questions. I, it's called Prayer 101, so this is where we're going. But the, I, want to, I want to address two questions. One, why pray? And second, what makes it hard to pray? I think those are important questions to help clear some of the rubble out of the way so that we actually begin to pray. So um, why pray? And I'll come back to the point I just made because it's the best one. We pray first for relationship with the Father. We pray because he likes our company. Try and get your head around that one. God actually likes to be in your presence. You might find that hard to accept. You might think it should be the other way around, and it should be, but that the fact remains, God loves to be in your presence. If you said to God, God is what, it, what is in your bucket list? You know one of the things he would immediately say? 
one of the things that's in my bucket list is that you and I could hang out one-on-one for a period of time. He loves to be in your company. Now, you've got to understand that to, to really be um, motivated and desirous to begin this journey that we call prayer. But he loves to be in your company. Prayer is simply keeping company with God. It's not just acquiring things from him. It's about discovering who God is. Now, when you pray, you'll learn some things about God. And that's very, very important. Can I, you know, can I just tell you flat out two or three of the things I've learned about God when I've come to him? And I've usually come to him with a list or with a lot of things. And here, here's some things that, that God has said to me about who he is when I've come into his presence. Now, you could do this too, but I guess I'm up here and you're not. So I'll tell you what I've, what I've learned and... Hopefully we can hear some of your stories. That's part of the journey this summer before we're done. But the first thing I ever heard God say um, when I was trying to regularly come into his presence was this. Dan, do you realize that every time the word Father comes off of your lips, my heart leaps? That changed my whole view of prayer. Do you, do you understand that every time, Dan, you say Father... My heart leaps. So often I came beaten down and bruised and crushed and feeling guilty and feeling not welcome. And yet he said, every time you come, my heart leaps. I didn't know that about God until he told me that. Another time I was, I, I was God, you know, I, this is a really good day because I got seven minutes today to spend in your presence. And as I began to just blast everything out, he, it, it's as though he went time out. You know what he said? He said, one thing you have to know about me is I am never in a hurry. And if you want to get to know me, you're going to have to slow down. I never forgot that either. I didn't know that about God until he told me that he's actually never in a hurry. Here's another thing I found out about God. This one blew all my fuses. He's um, generous. Well, actually, that's not true. It is true. But what I'm trying to say, what I'm trying to say is I knew he was generous. But what I found out, he's crazy generous. Do you know that about God? He is crazy, over-the-top generous. It's ridiculous, really. How did I find that out? One day, I was going back down the dirty, dusty road like the prodigal, heading back to the Father. And I was going to confess a truckload of sin. And I felt like such an idiot and such a fool. And I thought, like, I will not be welcomed. And I thought, it will, if, if I can just kind of get in there and pour it out and kind of get him to stamp this deal and say forgiven, it'll be a good day. I got there. I told him everything. And I did what I always do. I just waited quietly for a few minutes because I believe, and this is very, very important. Don't miss this. When you confess your sins to the Lord, you should always wait until he tells you and assures you that you're forgiven because you need to hear that. It's a wonderful thing when from his lips, he says, I will not count your sins against you. So wait for him. Don't be in two. Because you rush in and out, you miss so much good stuff from him. So I'm there and I'm waiting, just saying, oh, I hope he says today he's got this one covered. You know what he said? He said, I won't count your sins against you. I said, oh, that's so good. You are so gracious and generous. And I was kind of heading out the room. He said, hey, wait a minute. Do you want to hear more? I said, okay. He said, you're forgiven, but you know what I'd like you to do, Dan? I'd like, to, I'd like you to ask me for anything you want. I said, excuse me? He said, no, ask me for anything you want. I said, do you know what I just did? He said, that's dealt with, it's finished. Why don't you ask me for anything you want? He said, you were trying to do your own deal, do life your way, satisfy your own. Why don't you give me a crack at it? He said, give me the biggest list you've got and let me try and give it to you. I thought, this is crazy generous. I deserve to be on probation, sitting in the corner for a while, doing whatever. And here this God is saying, you're not only forgiven, but you know, I'm so excited. I just want to bless you with everything I've got. And I thought, it probably would be appropriate if I... If I do good for a month for you to say that, but not five minutes after I've told you what I've done. And he just asked me for whatever you want. He is crazy generous. I want to tell you something. 
That's the best thing about prayer is you discover who God is. And if you're not too big a hurry, he will blow your mind with who he is to you and for you. So that's the first reason you should pray is because you'll really get to know who God is. Second reason, it's the flip side of that, and it's one that we're all familiar with, is, well, where am I? I can't even find out where I am here. I'll tell you what it is when I find it here. Here it is, because God answers prayer. That's why. How could I forget that? Um, We pray to God so that we'll get to know who he is, his heart, but we pray to him because he actually answers prayer. The idea is we're needy people. We're not people that have it all together. We're not capable, really, of providing for ourselves all that we need, nor are we capable of bringing in God's kingdom in our heart, our home, our city, our country, our world. So we ask. And nothing is clearer in the Bible than that God answers prayer. And I could give you a truckload of verses. Let me give you just a smattering to just make the point. Um, Matthew chapter 7, verses 7 and 8. Um, this is a great place to start. But Jesus speaking in Matthew 7, 7 to 8 says this. Um, it says, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. He or she who seeks finds. And to that person that knocks, the door will be opened. Now, it's not meant to be analyzed. It's meant to be believed. That verse was not given to theologians or pastors or missionaries. It was given to a group of ragamuffins on a hillside overlooking the Sea of Galilee, who most of them never even graduated from high school. And when they heard, ask and you'll receive, seek and you'll find, knock and the door will be opened unto you, they just took it for what it was. And that's the way you're supposed to take it. You're supposed to ask, expecting to receive. You're supposed to look knowing that you'll find. You're supposed to knock on his door, knowing that he won't turn away and do something else. And then you have that great verse in Jeremiah 33, 3, that says, call to me, and I will answer you and tell you great and unsearchable things you don't know. It's just like, he throws out this great challenge. He says, hey, try calling me. I'll answer you. That's pretty cool. I like Psalm 65, verse 2. It says, oh, you who hear prayer, to you all people will come. Now, I need to to retranslate this for you because this is from the uh, older version, NIV. The new NIV, that if you have a little extra money, it's been revised and and some of the uh, translation changes that need to happen have happened. It came out in 2011. So when you go to buy a Bible, if you look at the... the, um, you know, the table of contents page facing that, it'll tell you when it was published. The 2011 NIV it would translate this verse this way, and it's the right way. O oh, you who answer prayer, to you all people will come. Do you see the difference? That's the real, the real meaning. O oh, you who answer prayer, to you all people come, or should come, or will come. And then you have that great um, psalm, Psalm 116, which is one of the, I think, one of the classic psalms in the whole book of Psalms, but I I love the way it goes. The first few verses, anyway, starts this way. I love the Lord. Why? Because he heard my voice. He heard my cry for mercy. Because he turned his ear to me, I will call on him as long as I live. Do you see the logic here? I was in great trouble. I called on him. He heard my cry. He turned his ear to me. So why would I ever stop crying out to him now? That's the thinking. The cords of death entangled me. The anguish of the grave came over me. I was overcome. By distress and sorrow, then I called on the name of the Lord, Lord, save me. The Lord is gracious and righteous. Our God is full of compassion. The Lord protects the unwary or the simple-hearted. When I was in great need, he saved me. Isn't that amazing? I mean, that's a really good reason to pray, actually, is that God answers prayer. Can I give you an illustration of how he answers prayer? If you were to go today to Dallas... Texas, you'd find um, in the outskirts of the city a church named Gateway Church, a very good church. The senior pastor, his name is Robert Morris. And he told a story not so long ago that I thought was absolutely amazing, so I want to tell it to you. The story that he told was um, about a man named Ray Alexander. 
And um, this story about Ray Alexander was about Ray Alexander and his relationship with Robert Morris's grandfather. Now, Ray Alexander, what he used to do is he was a Christian man. And in his Bible, he kept some names in the, in the cover of people that he was praying for that didn't yet know Jesus. And he would pray for them regularly. Every time somebody came to know Jesus, he would put a check mark beside that person. That's an answered prayer. So let me tell you the story that Robert Morris told. Robert Morris stood up one day and said, My grandfather used to work for the Texas Highway Department with a guy named Ray Alexander. Ray Alexander was a believer. My grandfather was not. Their job was to put asphalt in potholes. Now, just an aside, we could use them here, couldn't we? Anyways, Ray witnessed to my grandfather and said, Why don't you come over tonight after dinner And let me share more about Jesus with you. So my grandfather said, okay. So after dinner, he got up and he started to leave. And Robert said, my father, who was only 16 at the time, just got his driver's license and said, hey, can I drive you over? My grandfather said, sure, but you have to wait outside while Ray and I talk. So... We drove over, they drove over. My father sat alone in the car while my grandfather went in and talked with Ray Alexander. Finally, my dad got a little bored, so he got out of the car and he went up and sat on the steps of the front porch. And they had no air conditioning in those days. The front porch door was open, so he overheard the conversation. And for the first time, my father heard the gospel that Jesus was the Son of God. He came to earth and died on the cross for our sins as Ray shared it with my grandfather. Then my dad heard Ray Alexander say to my grandfather, Would you like to accept Jesus as your Savior? And my grandfather said, Nope. So, Ray Alexander said to my grandfather, then if you ever decide that you'd like to accept Jesus, you should pray a prayer like this. And he gave him a very simple prayer. And you know what happened, Robert said? My dad, sitting on the porch, actually prayed that prayer and got saved. Isn't that amazing? So, Robert said, as a result, I was brought up in a Christian home, and I became an evangelist. I did stadium crusades. I preached in churches, and thousands of people came to Christ. Then he said, looking over at Gateway Church, he said, and many of you have come to Christ through the ministry that I've had here. Well, then Robert said this. A few years before my grandfather died, he was 77 years old, and I thought I should go to him and try one more time to lead him to Christ. So he said at a family reunion, I took my grandfather aside, went into a room alone, And I shared Christ with him. And I said, would you like to come to Christ? And this time my grandfather said, yes, and accepted Christ. Ray Ray Alexander um, didn't know about that. So he said, I called Ray Alexander. He said, Ray Alexander didn't even know that my own dad got saved 45 years ago on his French port steps. So I said to him, I said, Ray, because of you, thousands of people have come into the kingdom. And now I want you to know that my grandfather's been saved too. Ray Alexander started to weep on the end of the phone. He said, your grandfather's the only name in the back of my Bible without a check beside it. He told me he'd prayed for my grandfather for 45 years, but as soon as he got off the phone, he was going to put a check beside my grandfather's name. Everyone on his list that he'd been praying for had come to Christ. That's a God that answers prayer, isn't it? Um, Why would we ever stop or give up? I'll tell you how he answers, just the way you and I answer our children sometimes when they ask us for stuff. Sometimes he says yes, sometimes he says no, and sometimes he says not yet. The problem for some of us is because he's answered some of our prayers no or not yet, we think we have unanswered prayer. But God always, it says in the Bible, God answers prayer. He'll do it no, yes, or not yet, or perhaps some other way. So I guess that's the second reason we ought to pray is simply because God answers prayer. I'll give you one more, and then we'll move on. And that's because to pray is to change. To pray is to change. Um, a lot of us come to Jesus, but we don't make much progress. And we seem to, we get so far, and then we fall on our face. Or we have this besetting sin, or this character issue that we never get beyond. And we, we can't figure it out. And You know, one of the reasons is because we're not that disciplined in this matter of keeping company with Jesus. 
but we're changed by prayer more than we actually realize. Prayer doesn't, it actually doesn't change God, but it changes the person, changes the person that prays. Now, if you were to do a study of the history of God's people, take King David for an example, or be a little more introspective and do your own history, you would find out that often their failure and their sin was the result of neglecting prayer, keeping company with God. Why why on earth do you think Jesus said that every day you ought to pray, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one? You try to stop praying that for a week and see what happens. I mean, he actually said we should pray that every day. When you pray that, you generally find yourself walking in paths of righteousness. When you don't pray that, you open yourself up to all manner of temptation and sin. Figure out when the last time you crashed and burned was and ask yourself, how disciplined was I during that period or on that day or at that time in my keeping company with Jesus? Now, the other place that's just beautiful in the Bible about this is Psalm 81. I'll, I just want to, I think I got a few minutes. I'm just going to go there and, and read a bit of it to you because it just, you won't find, you, listen to this. You will not get a better offer today than this offer in Psalm 81. So this is a great offer. It's God speaking. He's looking at Israel. First of all, he says, you know what? I'm the Lord your God who brought you up out of Egypt. And then he says this amazing thing. Open wide your mouth and I'll fill it. Don't let anybody tell you that God is trying to rain on your parade or make your life more miserable. He says, I rescued you from sin. Now, if you just open your mouth, I will fill it. Fill it. I mean, as wide as you can open it, as wide as I'll fill it. That's what he says. But then, then his heart breaks because he says, but my people wouldn't listen to me. Israel wouldn't submit to me. So I gave them over to their stubborn hearts to follow their own devices. Here's the deal. God says, I rescued you. I saved you. Now, my purpose is to make your life better than you could ever make it yourself beyond what you can imagine. So just open your mouth and let me fill it. But we say, no, you know, I still like some of that stuff. I still want to keep some of that in my life. And so there comes a point when God says, well, okay, you can have it. And you keep falling under the same stuff time and time again until you learn your lesson that only God can satisfy your desires. But you'd think God would wash his hands of them and us, but he says, no. He says, I'm still here. He says, if my people would only listen to me, if Israel, or put your name in there, would only follow my ways, how quickly would I subdue their enemies and turn my hand against their foes? Those who hate the Lord would cringe before him, and their punishment would last forever. But you... You would be fed with the finest of wheat, with honey from the rock. I would satisfy you. Now, here's a, here's a tip on reading the Bible. Always, always, always read it present tense. Never read it past tense. This is the word of the Holy Spirit speaking. It's not what he spoke, it's what he says. It's not what he said, it's what he says. So you take this present tense and you take it as an offer from him to you. If you would listen, you would pray, if you would speak, if you would hear, if you would hang out with me, I'll do two things for you. I'll quickly subdue your enemies and I'll satisfy you with the finest of wheat. That's why I say you will not get a better offer today than the one that God makes you there. But somehow with your whole being, you've got to say amen to that and and move into it. So that's... Um, to pray is to change, and I think that's a good reason to pray. So I, I think I'll just quickly get to the second question, um, which is that question, why, well, why don't we pray? I mean, those are probably three good reasons to pray. What keeps us from praying? I think we're not quite sure what holds us back. Most of us would suggest busyness, or we'd throw that up pretty quickly, but our busyness seldom keeps us from eating or golfing or making love or anything like that, does it? So... Um, I don't know that busyness is the real issue. I think we have to dig a little deeper. And when we do, at least when I do, I uncovered two things. See if they resonate with you. I think the first reason we don't pray is we're conditioned not to pray. We're actually conditioned not to pray. See, I don't need to give you a history lesson, but a shift took place in Western culture and society about three, maybe 400 years ago, um, that really radically um, disrupted our continuity with previous generations. For convenience sake, sacrificing accuracy, accuracy, that shift was called the Age of Enlightenment. And what actually happened was massive or seismic because it, it actually took God, 
who'd been at the center of all reality up to that point and now replaced people, men and women, in that place so that men and women now occupied center stage and God was put off to the side. The assumption of earlier generations that God or gods defined and accounted for everything was discarded and replaced with the conviction that we're perfectly capable of doing life on our own. And three or four hundred years later, we're a long way down the river, and we're at this place where people are absolutely center stage, and God is, well, if, if he's around at all, he's way out in the periphery, and we live in a generation and a culture and a world where people don't pray. And when you live in a world where people don't pray... When you grow up and you were brought up in a place where we've always been at the center and we've had to make our own way and do our own thing, then it's very difficult to be reconditioned and actually begin to pray again. But that's exactly what we need to do. And when God's not at the center, not only do you not pray, but you become God, so you begin to determine what's right or wrong. And especially that hits us in the area of sexuality and marriage. It's very, very difficult today to stand up in this church and say, this is what the Bible teaches about sex and marriage because I get pushback from all sorts of groups out there and all sorts of groups in-house because we have disregarded God and it's no longer God, it's my opinion. Um, and, And I think that it's when you live and you grow up in a culture, in a world like that, it's so hard to get back to that place where you say, I can't do anything without God. I don't know truth without God. I don't know how to do my job without God. I can't love my wife or my kids without God. See, we're so used to being self-made people. We have to come back to this place where God becomes the center of all reality. Until we get back there, we'll never pray with much intensity. So that's the first reason it's difficult to pray. The second one is very practical for me, and maybe you'll find it the same for you. There's this sense that we struggle with, a lot of us, that somehow we might not be welcome in God's presence. Perhaps we don't believe in prayer anymore. We tried it. God didn't seem to answer. We got disappointed, disillusioned. We were left shattered up on the rocks, as it were, and we have little faith left in it. We think, what's the point of coming back? I, he, it's like he didn't welcome me the first time. Why would he do now? I would say this to you. It doesn't matter how you feel. The Father's heart is wide open to you. And if you came, you would find that you were welcome to walk into his presence. Perhaps you only prayed when you were in trouble. And so you cried out to God and he actually answered. And, and you actually, in that whole deal, made a deal with him and said, If you will, then I will. But when he got you out of trouble, you forgot your part of it. And you think, Why would he hear me now? I never kept my commitment the first time, and I only pray to him when I'm in trouble. doesn't matter. If you're in trouble, pray to him. You would be welcome. And he gives to all people generously, and he doesn't find fault. It's our wrong views of God that keep us from coming into his presence. Perhaps you feel too sinful, too unworthy, a nobody, to come into his presence. He loves it when sinners come. And just say, here I am. I need mercy and grace. He loves that. He actually smiles when you come. Can you imagine the great joy on the Father's face when the prodigal came down the highway? Can you imagine how God feels when you come? I mean, we've got to get rid of this sense that we might not be welcome in God's presence. In Jesus' name, you are welcome to come. In Jesus' name, you are welcome to receive everything that you need. In Jesus' name, you are welcome to hang out in God's presence. So I think we ought to get started, and I think I'll end by telling you where to get started, which sounds kind of strange, but that's the way it'll be. Let me give you some advice on getting started. Um, This is it. It, And this is Prayer 101. When you're getting started, pray as you can, not as you can't. Pray as you can, not as you can't. Don't worry about fancy words. Don't worry about how somebody else prays. Pray as you can, not as you can't. Where do you begin? Well, right where you are. With the things that concern you, your families, your job, your neighbors, your friends. Talk to God about that. What are the things that you carry as anxieties in your heart about your family? Just start talking to God about those things. 
What about your neighbors? We have, we have a home, a couple homes down this way and a couple homes down that way, and they both sold, and there's new people coming in, so I'm starting to talk to God about our neighbors. God, help them, be, help them to be nice. That's what I'm thinking, so help them to be nice. I just pray as I can, and help us to be nice to them. That's a good place to pray. But I'll give you more substance as we go along, but that's, that's a place to start. Um, pray about your job. Your, your job is located in a certain place, and there's certain people around you for a reason. Pray about them. Ask God for wisdom with your job. Uh, talk to God about some of your friends whose marriages are blowing apart or who have cancer, whatever. Just say, God, I can't handle this. I'll never forget one of my great, great friends, Jim. I may have told you this before, but we, um, we have a group of men that pray here on Wednesday morning, and, and um, they pray long Christian theological prayers, and they really mean it. That's how they pray. And my friend Jim, who wasn't a believer yet, he was starting to come to church, said one day when we were running, he said, hey, I'd like to, I'd like to come to that prayer meeting on Wednesday morning. And my heart sank. I said, this is heavyweight prayers. And I said to my heart, Jim, you're not even a Christian. I, I don't know how you're going to handle this. But he showed up of all things. And you know, they always pray in a certain order from this guy around the table, around the end. So we sat over there. I put him at the end because I thought, I'll dumb it down, and then I'll jump up. Prayer will be over, and we'll all go for coffee. He won't be embarrassed or have to pray. So they all went for 10 or 15 minutes each, as they do, and, and that was good. God hears their prayer. I'm not trying to criticize what they do, but I was worried about my friend Jim. And um, I just said a little quick prayer, and I was halfway out of my chair, and ready to say, let's go for coffee, when Jim started to pray. How can he do that? He's not a Christian. But he was praying. And he started to sob. But how can he do that? And, and he started to pray about his dad with a brain tumor and his brother who had drug problems and this and that. And he, and he sobbed and he just, he prayed as he could for his dad and his friends and everything else. And I thought, I'm in the presence of something holy. Then he jumped up and he said, hell of a prayer meeting, guys, let's go for coffee, he said. <laughs> I think God understood that. Sure hope you do, but anyway... Um, you know what? Pray as you can, not as you can't, and start where you are. That's the deal. So, all that to say that I believe that God can reach us and bless us in the ordinary matters of our daily life and in the stuff that we think about because that's what real prayer is about. What I'm going to do every week is I'm going to put a prayer up on the screen. <clears throat> it's from <clears throat> somebody this week, Richard Foster. What, when you're learning to pray, one of the best things you can do is be mentored by great prayers. And in the history of the church, there's been some great, great prayers. And some of the prayers that they've prayed, they've recorded for us. And I find that sometimes they are way better than I am. So I just grab their prayers and I pray them. And I, I hope next week to show you some of the best. And I know this is, this is rather naive on my part, but I, I still actually believe a few people still read books. So I'm going to show you. Um, some of the great classics on prayer so that you can learn from them. Not some of the popular stuff that you'll find on the shelf of bookstores. You can get lots of popular stuff on prayer. The classics are the things that actually change your life. And I want to show you some of them. And some of these great prayers come out of these books. This is from a book called Prayer by Richard Foster. He's still alive. He's a Quaker. And uh, excellent person in terms of spiritual formation and um, the disciplines, celebrate Celebration of Discipline was one of his great books. But anyways, I just love this prayer, and, 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 and I think it's a great one for us to start with. And I, Next week, I'm going to have them at the door for you because so many people ask for this at the end of the first service. I'll, I'll have them all written out for you, but I'll, I'll give you one a week. But this one from Richard Foster just says, Dear Jesus, how desperately I need to learn to pray. And yet when I'm honest, I know that I often don't even want to pray. Now, isn't that just a great, honest prayer? I'm distracted. I'm stubborn. I'm self-centered. In your mercy, Jesus, I like this part, bring my wanter more in line with my needer so that I can come to want what I need. In your name and for your sake, I pray. Amen. So that's just a great way to learn to pray is just to grab a prayer that somebody else has prayed and got God's attention with and if it makes sense to you, pray it. Nothing wrong with that. So let me end by going back to the verse that we started with at the beginning, Revelation 3.20. Hold, I stand at the door and knock. If anybody hears me and opens the door, I'm going to come in, sit around the table with them, and have fellowship with them, and reminds us that the heart of everything we do is relationship. 
We have a chance to sit at the table with Jesus this morning before we leave. And I hope it's not a quick in and out. We have the table of the Lord. And it's not just something we kind of roll out every month. This is, this is the very, <clears throat> I hope you understand this. This is the very high point of everything Christians do. It's the thing that Jesus looks forward to the most every month. is sitting at this table with you. Having symbols of food, cracker or bread and a cup. And fellowshipping with Jesus for a few minutes before we head out one-on-one personally. The bread and the cup, you know they're symbols of what happened at the cross where Jesus died for our sins. The bread is body and the cup is blood. But, but more than that, when it's put in your hand or you take it this morning, what if, you, what if you sat there and took a few minutes while we all get it? And what if you realized, I get to sit at a table with Jesus this morning? And what if you just said, looking across the table into his eyes with the bread and the cup, thank you, thank you, thank you for what you did for me. And what if you just stopped talking and listened? I wonder what he would say to you this morning. I think he'd say some astounding things. Let's fellowship around this table for a few minutes with Jesus before we leave. I'll give thanks for the bread and for the cup. Then we'll hand it out to you and when we all have it, I'll I'll just give us some instruction as how we can eat it and drink it. So let me pray. Father, we're here today because, well, we want to be here. We were hungry to come and learn from you and hear from you and hungry to worship you. And it's a delight that you would actually take the time, Father and Lord Jesus and Holy Spirit, to sit at a table with us and enjoy our company and we get to enjoy yours. So, Lord, as we take the bread and the cup, we thank you for the bread and we thank you for the cup. We'll never forget what it means that you died so that we don't have to and that you came to forgive us and give us life like we've never had before. And so we humbly take the bread and the cup and open the door that you knock at and say, please come in and fellowship with us this morning. For we pray in Jesus' name, amen.
There is freedom Lift your eyes to heaven There is freedom Freedom reigns in this place Showers of mercy We stand together. That'd be a good way to do this. And why don't we, in the presence of the living Lord, and in each other's presence, eat this bread and drink this cup with gladness and joy in our hearts? I just want to pray a benediction over you this morning. We're going to worship one more time and just say this too, that we have a number of people up here today that would love to pray with you. So we know God answers prayer. And if you are sick or just want to thank God or just want to pray for a friend or family, whatever, I mean, we're here to pray with you and we'll be here as long as we need to be. So um, whether it's during the worship or afterwards, just make your way up and we'd be delighted to be able to spend some time praying together. So Father, I now pray that for all of us here, as we leave this place, we would be convinced and rooted uh, in your love, convinced of your love and rooted in it. And I pray that the grace of the Lord Jesus would just overflow in our minds and in our hearts and our lives, our families and our marriages, even when we don't deserve it. And I pray that we would experience personally, literally this week, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, for we pray in Jesus' name, amen.